Hello and welcome in to another episode of the Fantasy Football Forecast. I'm Trevor Scott, your host, joined by Matt Giraldi. What's going on, guys? And we're going to be getting into wide receivers 26 to 40 today. So we did wide receivers 1 through 25 in our wide receiver preview. If you have not seen that yet, go ahead and go check that out. Hopefully, we're starting to get a couple more viewers here. And if you're interested in what um, our rankings are for the top 25, we do have a part one and a part two breaking that down. So without further ado, let's get into wide receiver 26, Calvin Ridley. Cool. So Calvin Ridley last year finishes the wide receiver, wide receiver 17 for the Jags. A lot of highs and lows. So five games over 19, half PPR points, seven games under six points. Joins the Titans on a four-year deal worth up to $92 million. Um, and it seems like the Titans are kind of all in on Will Levis this year. They drafted offensive tackle J.C. Latham in the first round. You know, they move on for, from Derrick Henry, which suggests that they're going to be a more pass-heavy team this year. Um, you know, with a projected win total of only six and a half games and a new offensive coordinator who was the passing game coordinator at Jacksonville last year, um, we're likely going to see a lot of pass attempts from this team. Now, DeAndre Hopkins is 32 years old. He's already out four-ish weeks. You know, no guarantee he's going to be ready for the regular season. You know, Burks might get some opportunities. And Tyler Boyd was brought in. And I guess Boyd is just good enough to kind of be annoying when you have the other players um, on the team. But, you know, Ridley is going to be a pretty heavy target for me this year at his ADP because, you know, like I said, with father time catches up with Hop or he can't stay healthy, passing game should really run through Ridley and you know even if Levis isn't the long-term answer he's got an absolute cannon and you know there could be a a garbage time hero type situation for Calvin Ridley yeah I I agree with everything you said but the the one thing that I do want to highlight on top of that with Ridley is that Hopkins is out four to six weeks with a knee injury he's going to miss a lot of camp he's going to not necessarily get back to full speed right away so you know Ridley now in my opinion is going to His ADP is going to rush up the board. Um, Right now, he's like, I think, wide receiver 33, something like that. And so this ranking has the DeAndre Hopkins injury baked in. Um, I really like Ridley now. He should be the number one pretty much undoubtedly. He's going to be running that in camp the whole time. Um, So, you know, I think if you can get him later in drafts right now, I think you need to attack the fact that the rankings that you're on your site might not be updated or the ADP data is not going to reflect that injury um, with all of the data that's been accumulated from the off season. So uh, yeah, really like Ridley this year. I think he also too, something you didn't mention is he got really unlucky with like almost touchdowns last year. I think he had like four catches in the end zone where like his toe was on the line or he just couldn't get his second foot down. Um, so, you know, he could have had an even better season on that wide receiver 17 finish. Um, so overall love Calvin Ridley. Number 27 is T Higgins. Um, some people might be seeing this and be like, wow, that's really low for T Higgins. But I think we both agree that we're kind of out on Higgins. Unfortunately, he just hasn't stayed consistently healthy long enough. And it's for me, I just, I have, I guess, a sour taste in my mouth just from owning him in the past and being so high on him in the past as a player. And, you know, the, when when you get two quarters and then he goes out, you know, and then he misses one week and then he's back, right? And it just, those sort of injuries happen to him, I feel like, all the time. Or he'll blow up one week. It'll be nine catches, 140 yards. And you're like, all right, let's go. He's going to get some momentum. And then it's like three for 20 the next week. And then, so, you know, you look up at the end of the year and his numbers have been pretty solid. But it's just really difficult for me to take him um, expecting any sort of consistent production. So as a back end wide receiver three, as as a starter in a three wide receiver league, I'm I'm comfortable at this point um, playing on the upside. We know he's extremely talented, and we know that the offense, if Burrow stays healthy, which is another element, but if Burrow is healthy, he should be productive. Um, And you know, there's also the contract element that's going on. Um, but he did sign. He's in camp. So this year, in a single season approach to this, I think we can kind of rely on him as at this point. We, he should be a starter in three wide receiver leagues. Um, and, you know, in two wide receiver leagues with one flex, I might look elsewhere anyways, like shoot for a little more upside. But uh, when you need a guy that you are confident in starting, I think Higgins is your guy. 
Yeah, I think the most important thing that you said there was those games where he's on the field, he's starting, you have to put him in your lineups, and then, you know, he's he's on the sidelines for most of the time. It's kind of this on-off situation where his injuries aren't like, okay, he misses four weeks, then it's wheels up. It's just kind of this, like, game of, of cat and mouse that's, that's very frustrating. So I, I kind of have the same sentiment toward Higgins as you do this year. Yeah, he literally had a game where he was active and played one snap. What the heck is that? Like, I don't yeah. want to deal with that crap. Just yeah. tell me if he's going to play or not. I don't want to deal with it. Don't. Yeah. Oh, God, it's just like, like I said, maybe it's a little biased because I've had him when that kind of stuff has happened. And like, you lose when that happens and you get nothing out of a player that you're counting on, you lose. And it's just annoying. So that's, that's playing into this ranking, you know, whether it's fair or not. Um, I'm not entirely sure where he's even ranked in consensus, but, um, you know, I, I just think that he's getting pushed down significantly below his talent level just because of things like that. Yeah, I agree. All right, number 28, Zay Flowers. So Zay Flowers had a pretty solid rookie campaign. You know, he finishes the wide receiver 29, 10 and a half, half PPR points per game. Um, you know, Mark Andrews got hurt week 11, which did lead to a jump in production from Flowers. Um, you know, on in terms of, you know, receptions and yards, it, it wasn't that big of a, a spike as one might seem. However, um, you know, it, it came with the end zone target. So the first 10 games of the season, Flowers had like one end zone target. And, you know, after Andrews went out, it was like six end zone targets. So I, I think that might have something to do with it. Um, in terms of deep balls, there seemed to be some room for improvement, and maybe some hidden upside. Here is he and Lamar connected on only 11 of 23 targets of 20 plus yards. Um, he was great against zone with an 85% sex, success rate, uh, which is important because Lamar faces a lot of zone just because his tendency to, to take off and run. But I will say, you know, Flowers upside is capped a little bit in the sense that, you know, they don't throw as much as other teams. They tend to be in a lot of positive game scripts, which I think will continue even more so now with Derrick Henry. Um, this should be a very concentrated offense like we've talked about quite a bit. And I am making a point to leave, you know, every draft with, you know, one of the premier Ravens players, not named Rashad Bateman. Did you say room for growth after saying that it's 11 for 23 on yards on passes 20 plus yards that's like 45 percent. that's really good isn't it not necessarily i mean look at all those deep i think, balls I think that's they, really they good on. for connecting on deep balls i know but 45 45 percent on down down the field throws that's i don't know that there's that much more upside i mean if the volume increases there but the per completion percentage i feel like even if even if it could be better i feel like that's pretty good um you know and I, i'm obviously Starting with that, because I'm not a big Zay Flowers fan here, I I do think, you know, that he's going to be the number one receiver, but we saw Andrews go down, and you said the, the end zone usage went up a little bit, but his targets and his role didn't change when, like, the top target getter in the offense went down, right? And those a lot yeah. of those targets and a lot of that work went to Isaiah Likely. And he kind of just stepped in, and, and we didn't even see Flowers increase uh, his role. So I'm I'm a little concerned, and obviously he's a rookie, okay? So like that could all just be the case of we don't want to change what's working here. We're getting the production we anticipated out of him, and we're going to you know increase his volume or increase his productivity next year, or in you know adjust the offense to to build more around him, but. I, I'm not sure that that's going to happen yet. And I'm probably not going to push him up until I do actually see it. Um, even if it's for a short span of the season, right? If if they decide like four or five game stretch and he's just blowing up, I'll be like, okay, it's there. Um, they just have to commit to him as the top option. But um, for now, it's going to be Andrews. I think in the end zone, it's going to be Andrews. And there's been a lot of positive talk around Likely. There's been a lot of positive talk around Bateman. So, you know, if there's going to be additional targets going to anybody else, I'm just not sure that Flowers is going to be somebody that you're going to end up uh, feeling confident starting week over week. Yeah, that's fair. And I think it was like half a catch per game more and less than 10 yards with with Andrews out. So maybe reading in between the lines a little too much with the red zone stuff, because you're right, Andrews is, is going to be that guy. Yeah, as long as he's healthy, right? And I we expect him to be as of now. So yeah. 
All right, getting into number 29. We've we've broke this guy down quite a bit. We did a short on him. We did the Packers episode talking directly about him. Um, so I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody that's listened to, you know, uh, our recent videos here that I would have Jaden Reed ranked at 29. Um, I'm much more enthusiastic about him than Zay Flowers from an upside perspective, but I do also recognize that you know, Flowers is going to be the number one. Reed at least has a little bit of a murky situation. And, you know, it could be like a 1A, 1B, 1C situation. Reed isn't necessarily guaranteed to play 80 plus percent of the snaps. Um, that's something that Flowers just doesn't have concerns with. So despite my negative talk on Flowers, Matt kind of gave you the positive angle. So I, I kind of dampened it down a little bit. But Reed, you know, I... I do really expect that he's going to take a step forward this year. He finishes wide receiver 23 last year. I think there's room for significant more, significantly more upside there, um, especially with targets and yards because a lot of his production came from his 10 touchdowns. So if he's in a more consistent role, if he is on the field 80% of the time and he is getting you know eight targets a game, I really think that he's going to exceed this draft position by quite a bit. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and nothing really else to add other than, you know, I encourage viewers to, to check out the Packers wide receiver breakdown because we get you know really into the weeds with Reed and, and the other guys. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I would say these these last two guys are back to back um, second round. Uh, I'm sorry, second year players. So, um, you know, these are these are guys that we're still trying to get a feel for. And if going into this year, we'll, we'll look back and be like, wow, how did we not have this guy higher? How did we not have this guy higher? Um, it's, it's a real thing for second year players still trying to gauge how good they can be. All right. Getting into number 30, Malik neighbors. Yeah. So neighbors is <clears throat> going to be a very heavy target for me this year. You know, he's an athletic freak, checks every box, reminds me of a lot of Jamar chase, not just the LSU thing, but he's already dominating camp and I'd expect his ADP to keep climbing, you know, as, as we get more positive reports. Um, you know, Daniel Jones and to some extent Brian Dable are, are kind of playing for their jobs this year. And from that perspective and narrative, I'd imagine they'd drop as many plays to neighbors as possible. You know, no one on the Giants had over 80 targets last year. So I think he's going to be the clear guy when you look at the depth chart. Now, the downside is if, if Daniel Jones is just awful and things fall apart in New York, we could be looking at a situation similar to what we've seen with you know Garrett Wilson the past couple seasons. But, you know, I, I definitely have neighbors pushed up higher than this and I think he will continue to climb on my board and you know when I'm on the clock in a draft a few beers deep I'm probably going to push him up even higher but I know you and I have always kind of <laughs> have always you and rookies, targeted man I know and that was kind of the point I was going to make you know you and I have always targeted rookies quite a bit different but you know neighbors is someone that you were you know talking up quite a bit in the, in the pre-draft process uh, so I'm kind of curious what your approach to him is uh, this year yeah, I was really hoping that the Chargers were going to take him, um, you know, and I just obviously they got Alt, and I am very happy about that, too. But um, I thought Neighbors was a very good fit for the Chargers offense. And, you know, Lad McConkey's kind of Neighbors light um, in terms of the role he's going to play. So that's why I was talking him up in the pre-draft process. Um, I, I'm just not a big fan of rookies already. And then you put neighbors with a quarterback who's never supported a top 36 wide receiver. Um, and, you know, do we really want to put our faith, you know, in our fifth round pick, sixth round pick in Daniel Jones? You know, I, I don't know. I just, I just can't do it, I guess. And my ranking reflects that like at 30, I'm going to have zero neighbors. Okay. He's already getting pushed up into the top. I've seen him go in the top 20 receivers in drafts. Um, so, you know, I, more power to you if you guys listening want to draft him. Okay, go for it. He's got upside. You know, he, he was one of the best receiving prospects that we've seen. This has nothing to do with him as a player. This has to do with his situation. And I'm, I'm not going to take a chance on something I've never seen, even if he does pay off, right? Even if he does blow up, I'm like, okay, that's, that's great. I'll try and get in on him next year. Um, and I'm going to take something that I feel is a little more safe. Um, so that's that's just my overall feeling on neighbors. I don't want a bust. I don't want somebody that I feel like has true bust potential here in the middle rounds of receivers. 
and that's fair. And if you snipe him in our home league draft, I'm going to be very, very disappointed in you. That would be very surprising, honestly. If I get him in our home league draft, which our home league draft is in like two weeks at this point, I would be very surprised. There's going to be no sniping. It's going to be he fell a long time if I if I do end up with him, um, you know. And uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. I just I just I don't know. I like you listen to you listen to some of the other analysts talking about neighbors and like like Sal has him at twenty four overall. Like CBS has been pushing him up into the third, like end of the third round, beginning of the fourth round of 12 team leagues. Like that's in the top 40 overall players, you know? So these, these uh, other analysts are really starting to gain momentum and and push neighbors way up their boards. And I'm, I'm not going to do it. So I just don't think I'm going to get him, you know, and maybe I miss, but that's just where I'm at with neighbors. Fair enough. All right, so tier eight, shooting for upside. So this is this this is like where the the flex tier starts for both of us, you know. And so we're gonna get into uh, thirty one uh, here with Keenan Allen, and obviously Keenan Allen is an as a great talent, right? I mean, we saw him be wider uh, top end wide receiver last year. He was wide receiver three before he got hurt, and you know a lot of that came from having high volume from Justin Herbert. And so he gets pushed way down here because of the car- target competition he's going to be dealing with. Um, rookie quarterback, he's got DJ Moore in front of him on the depth chart, and then Roma Dunze behind him on the depth chart. Um, I just did a breakdown video with DJ Moore in it, so I did hype up DJ Moore quite a bit in that video. Go check that one out. Um, but overall, I think at 31, right, you're, I think it fits the bill here perfectly shooting for upside because... If he is the security blanket for Caleb Williams, there's a chance here that he does find his way into like a 22, 23% target share. And Keenan Allen has proven that he can be very productive with that level of uh, opportunity. So, you know, he could finish as wide receiver 20 with even a reduced workload. And so, you know, there's just a lot of really good receivers, it feels like this year. And Keenan Allen is one that's getting pushed down because of role, but not because of necessarily any fallen off talent here. So uh, what do you think on Keenan? Yeah, I think the most important thing that you said, in my opinion, is security blanket, right? I mean, you've got these two wide receivers on the perimeter and, you know, Caleb Williams, sure, in college, likes to spread it around quite a bit. Maybe once he gets comfortable, we see more of that, but there's no easier pass than a a quick one to Keenan Allen when you're a rookie quarterback. So I, I think that like you mentioned, you know, he isn't, he isn't really someone that I've, you know, been targeting a whole lot, but I, I do see what you mean with, you know, that 20 ish potential to finish at, but kind of like what we're going to talk about with, you know, the Texans receivers. Um, there's just, there's just a lot of, a lot of mouths to feed. I don't know. It's, it scares me a bit. Yeah. It's just tough to count on the volume. And I really think he's going to need the volume to kind of pay off. Right. He's not, a, he doesn't have blazing speed. Um, I don't know how much they're going to use him out on the goal line. So, you know, there's there's some definite concerns in terms of, um, you know, yardage and touchdown upside with, with him yeah. overall. But you alluded to the Texans, so let's get into Tank Dell. Yeah, so unfortunately Tank Dell only played 11 games last year, but, you know, he was very solid in those games. He was the wide receiver 16 in, in fantasy points per game. And, you know, when he and Nico shared the field together in nine games, their fantasy points per game were almost identical. And, you know, entering Tank Dell's second year, there's always kind of that second or third year breakout that we hear about all the time. But, you know, I say this all the time, but CJ Stroud told the Texans to draft him, their best friend, Stroud had him on the field in a hypothetical matchup if his best offense versus Michael Parsons' best defense. Um, the elephant in the room, unfortunately, is, is Stefan Diggs getting traded to the Texans, which kind of curbed some of the, the tank Dell to the moon hype. And, you know, Diggs had kind of a weird year last year, starting strong and then really disappeared at the end. I, I think that was more of a Joe Brady offense thing than a Diggs fall off because he's only 30 years old, I want to say. So I, I don't think he's kind of at that point yet, but the interesting thing with with Tank Dell is I think a lot of times we just kind of picture him as this like slot receiver, but 
think he only played like 20 ish percent of his snaps in the slot. And he was actually almost as successful against man coverage as he was against zone. He's kind of this weird anomaly where if you told someone that he was six feet tall, 200 pounds, it, a lot of it would make sense. But just given his frame, it's, I don't know, it's weird and he's exciting. And I guess long story short, he's, he's someone I'm going to be targeting because I have him and Diggs like neck and neck. And so it, Given the ADP, I'm I'm going to be more in on on Tank Dell. Yeah, and you know, like you like you mentioned before, Diggs got traded. These guys were getting treated in drafts, kind of like Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel, right? The the teammates yeah. that were going relatively close in ADP of both in the top twenty, um, you know, and sometimes even in the top fifteen, just because it was it seemed like this offense was going to be extremely good. Like you said, they they were scoring very similar when they were on the field together. And then Diggs comes in, and I think it's – I mean, if you think that they're going to be relatively similar producers, then you're going to end up with a lot of Tank Dell because he's going to be higher on your lists than on mine. Um, I, I'm genuinely worried that he's going to get boxed out of the offense a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm worried that if they aren't going to run – or, you know, if they're running 75% three wide receiver sets, that he's only going to be on the field for 75% of the plays – um, and then when he is on the field, he's competing with two superior talents. Um, and I know that there's, you know, we look at the sample size and him and Nico kind of had the same production while they were on the field. But then when you take a step back and look at what Nico's production was like when he wasn't on the field, it, it wasn't like Nico struggled. Like Nico was insanely productive when Dell wasn't on the field. And I think it would be a little foolish to like try and force feed Dell and not give Nico those same opportunities. And so I expect the coaching staff to take advantage of the fact that Nico Collins really kind of had a true breakout in his third season. And, you know, Dell is going to be operating in that third role. So I do like Tank Dell. I, I just, I see him an underdog going in the top 45 and it's like, okay, I'm again, it's one of those things like neighbors getting pushed up. Dell is getting pushed up. I'm just not there with these guys. So right. I'm but those are more like up. the spike. I mean, the spike weeks, right? Like not having, yeah, the spike line. weeks, Tank but Dell I still gets... like, you see, you can still see Tank Dell going in round six, you know, of standard leagues round seven or round eight of super flex leagues and you know he's going ahead of all of these guys even listed on the screen like sometimes you know and so i just i'm just not there with tank dell and i i don't agree with you about tank dell being similar to stefan diggs i think they brought in diggs and i i really think that he's going to be more competing with nico collins for the you know one one a and dell be the three than you know nico being the one and and diggs and dell kind of competing for the two spot so that's just my opinion on how I think the offense is going to shake out and how I'm going to be drafting it. Fair enough. So going into number 33, Hollywood Brown. Um, we'll get into another Chiefs receiver later in this uh, later in this video, but I think for right now, I like this uh, ranking for Hollywood Brown at 33. I think he, assuming the suspension comes through for Rice, I think he's going to be the number one receiver on the offense for a majority of the season, which would be a very great asset. I think um, he has speed so he can get deep. He was getting before he kind of got phased out of the offense in Arizona. And before he was dealing with nagging injuries at the end of last year, you know, he was, he's been pulling down 10 targets a game and nine targets a game for a year and a half now. So um, if he's doing that with Mahomes, any sort of level of that with Mahomes, I think, this is going to be the best weapon that Mahomes has had in a long time. And it's going to be hard for me to see him not blow up, right? And when that suspension comes down for Rice, I think I'm going to even push Hollywood Brown up further. I think he's going to put, I think I'm going to put him ahead of Neighbors, ahead of Reed, ahead of Flowers. I'll probably have him there at 28. Um, if we do get news on the suspension before our drafts. Now, the, the court date for Rice, oh, actually, let's get into that later, right? So, I don't know that Rice is going to get suspended, so that I might have to end up pushing him down if we get news that it's not going to happen this year. So this is a volatile player right now with like un yeah. unknown news kind of surrounding the Chiefs receiver room. Uh, but overall, I really like Hollywood as a player. I think he could earn a lot of targets from Mahomes, and that could lead to a lot of production in somebody that 
will far outseed, uh, far exceed this draft position. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same number of moving him to 28 if um, Rice is suspended because obviously we have mm -hmm. a couple of guys that are a little bit different, but I think Hollywood was a, a great guy to bring in for, for the Chiefs. And you're right, you know, the fact that we don't have any news is a little bit weird and makes it seem more likely that it might not happen, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second too because Rice is later in this video. So let's go to number 34, Christian Kirk. Captain Kirk finished last year as wide receiver 47, got, you know, he was hurt week 13, missed the remainder of the season, but he was pacing for almost 100 catches and like 1,300 yards. Um, you know, the, the Jags have a lot of vacated targets with the departure of Calvin Ridley and Zay Jones. I think it was like 250 targets or kind of up for grabs. Now, obviously, they spent first round pick on Brian Thomas Jr., who you can make a strong argument for, would have been the wide receiver one in the 2023 draft class. Um, they also brought in Gabe Davis, who's like the most annoying fantasy player of all time. As far as Christian Kirk goes, I, I think he's kind of a safe floor play that I don't mind as my wide receiver three in three wide receiver formats if I attack you know other positions earlier, but not someone that I see as like a super sky high ceiling. Yeah, and I think the ceiling part is why I have him ranked low. I Kirk is somebody that I always feel like I should have higher. And then I do the ranking, I sit down, I rank all these guys, and it's like, why? I just, I don't know. He's, he's not, not fun enthusiastic. to rank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's not and fun. Then, and I, yeah, I was like no, researching. He's done. I was and like, then, dude, he's, he's good. Yeah, and then we'll we'll be in week four, and he'll be wide receiver 13 on the year so far, and we'll all be like, dude, why does Hamza have Christian Kirk again, you know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. Like you said, th there was fall off last year. He wasn't the one last year, and he might be the one this year. So th there is upside here, right? I mean, he genuinely can be a very productive player. And so if he puts it together for a full season – you're going to wish you had drafted him for sure. Um, and, you know, I think his, his ADP is right around 34. So um, we both like him. I, I do think, again, sticking with the theme of this tier, he's very much able to exceed this draft position. A top 20 finish would not even surprise me. Um, and so maybe I should have him ranked a little higher. I just think overall, like you said, they brought in a lot of weapons. I'm not big on Trevor Lawrence. I just don't think he's that good. Um and so, you know, that holds me back a little bit from Kirk as well. Uh, but overall, I think it's a good pick. Even if you're down in this round, right, and you're searching for your third wide receiver, if you wait, uh, you know, you filled out both your running backs, you have both your quarterbacks, you have a couple receivers, maybe you pick the tight end, right, and you're in round eight, I do think Kirk is is a great pick. And I think he's somebody that you will be able to rely on as a starter. I agree. All right, 35. This is my guy right here. I feel like I end up with him a lot. And he's, you know, his consensus rank is just so much lower than this, too, is Deontay Johnson. Um, you know, I think he's in a position where he's going to get a ton of volume. So when you're down at wide receiver 35, maybe go with the guy that's going to get a ton of volume, um, even if it's going to be on a terrible offense, even if the quarterback's maybe not that good. Um, even though he seems to be accurate. So if Deontay is able to get open in the short area. Young should be able to put it on him. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure what else to even really say about it because there isn't a much better, a bigger case than the volume here. Um, Deontay hasn't been super efficient in his career. He's not going to be blowing the top off of defenses. He doesn't have the, the breakaway speed or anything. He's going to be on a low-scoring offense. So if we look up at the end of the year and he's got four touchdowns, like would that be disappointing? I'm not even sure. So... Um, you know, th those elements are definitely holding him back. It's why he's ranked even lower than this in in other drafts. But when, we, when we've when we been doing mock drafts, when we're, you know, when we run through um, players that you like in certain different areas, I always am like, uh, Deontay Johnson should be higher than this just on volume alone. So uh, I still have a little bit of faith in Young in terms of how accurate of a passer he could be. And so that's why I like Deontay. I think he's the, the offense is going to be built around him. Hopefully he can rein in the drops. You know, he's obviously struggled to drops throughout his career. Um, and has a couple drops in camp already, but uh, I still like him. I'm still going to be drafting him more aggressively than his ADP. And so uh, a player that I expect to get in quite a few leagues. 
I agree. I, I like Deontay quite a bit too. And I do like that Dave Canales is coming in and I, I think he should help Bryce Young quite a bit. I mean, he was the quarterback coach in Seattle in 2022 when Geno finished as like QB5. And then last year, you know, he was the OC in Tampa Bay when, you know, Baker went off. And I'm not saying that Bryce Young is going to finish as a top 10 fantasy quarterback, but let's not forget that he wasn't the almost consensus top rated quarterback prospect just a year ago. So I, I do see how, you know, like everything you said with him locking on to Deontay, that he could have a, a very solid season, albeit a cap touchdown upside. But you know, we saw last year with those few weeks where Adam Thielen was like, really really good like i I just kind of picture that that's what yeah that's what deontay is gonna be now i I will say i I have spent more time hyping up carolina that maybe i'm comfortable with i've talked about jonathan brooks a lot i've talked about xavier Leggett. i've talked about deontay like i I do need to pump the brakes a little bit because i still think they're going to be the worst team in the league but if you're in like a three wide receiver especially ppr format he can be your three you want to talk about like a floor play similar to Christian Kirk? I, I think that's a very safe pick. I agree. I think, I think uh, you know, he's in a he's in a good spot, right? I think being on a bad team where the offense can be built around him because there's not very many teams that are going to build their offense around Deontay Johnson, right? Like so, right. Um, I think that's going to help his his floor and his volume. So, um, all right, tier nine. Um, so low end flex players, right? These are going to be the ones that. If you're looking for a receiver in a PPR, or maybe half PPR league, um, you know, and you really want, or, or you know, your first bench guy, set maybe second bench guy, um, we're going to start that off with Terry McLaurin. So McLaurin led the commanders in pass attempts, targets, receptions, and yards by a wide margin, but he still finished as the wide receiver 32. And Sam Howell finished as the QB 12 in fantasy somehow, but obviously the underlying statistics were, were not very pretty. So McLaurin is kind of that weird type of player that I've never really gotten or been all that in on because I just feel like every year in drafts, he goes higher than, you know, maybe I'm expecting him to go or comfortable taking him. But I will say a shot on Terry McLaurin is kind of a shot on the new quarterback in Jane Daniels and the new regime. You know, there's a new head coach, new offensive coordinator, new GM, you know, camp reports so far are positive. Uh, you know, Terry McLaurin's already pr- praised Jaden Daniels' deep ball, which obviously is one of his strengths at LSU. Um, I've been pretty vocal about my concerns with Daniel, but deep ball in a clean pocket isn't necessarily one of them. I do worry ab- about his ability to stay healthy, and given that their backup quarterback is Marcus Mariota, if, if you reach on McLaurin and Daniels misses time, there's a very, very low floor, like a, a droppable floor here, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, this is a guy I'm not going to get because I'm seven spots behind ADP on McLaurin. And I, I don't, I don't believe in Jaden Daniels. I, I think I've made that clear. I am not going to be taking a chance on anybody. Maybe Brian, uh, Brian Robinson, if he drops, uh, really far, but they brought in Eckler. They have Brian Robinson. Jaden Daniels is going to be running himself. Uh, I, I just don't know where the volume is going to be here. You know, even if he pulls down a 25% target share, like if they're running 30 plays, that's really not going to be that many targets, right? Like seven and a half a game. I Well, that's kind of the point I was making I about last year where he got here. all this, he got all this volume and still finished as wide receiver 32. It's like, yeah. And I expect I the know. volume to go away. So I, yeah. I don't know. I don't get the, I get, I get he's way more talented than this, right? If he was on the Chargers, right. he'd probably be a top 20 receiver, but yeah. with the situation and how the offense was run and, you know, how through 14 weeks last year, like right before he was starting to think about getting benched, I mean, he was leading the league in passing. So, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just, again, there's, there's, a positive here that he's a really talented player himself. He's really good. So if you like drafting like really good players, he's definitely better than the three guys in front of him in terms of just an NFL talent. Uh, but his situation and, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't think he's going to be that productive, unfortunately. So uh, buyer beware, like you said, low floor. There's a, there's a droppable floor here for McLaurin. So, yeah. um, you know, make sure you keep that in mind when you draft him. Number 37, Chris Godwin. Um, 
you know, I probably should, after how much I just <laughs> talked to Downton McLaurin, I probably should have Godwin ahead of McLaurin because I do really like Godwin uh, this year. And I think that there's a chance that if he gets into the end zone a little bit more last, than he did last year, I mean, he only scored twice last year and Evans had 13 and their target shares were relatively similar. So if there's some sort of balancing there and Evans gets nine and Godwin gets six, you know, maybe there's a chance that Godwin is in every week flex play, or he's just a very good bench receiver to have if somebody goes down um, or bye weeks, uh, maybe he gets it rolling and becomes your number three receiver. You start seeing him ranked, you know, in the top 25 uh, weekly there. I think there's that sort of role for him available. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to see him go off and be like the number two wide receiver like he was uh, a few years back. Um, and I do think that he's buried behind Evans this year. I, I really am high on Evans going into this year in a way that I haven't been because Godwin has always kind of produced side by side with Evans throughout his career. Uh, but I think the Bucks offense is going to be good. I think that their person or their personnel is all the same. So, uh, you know, the offense I expect to operate relatively similarly, despite the offensive coordinator change. And I think Godwin is another guy that if you get, for your flex spot at receiver that you will be relatively happy with. And if you can get him as your first bench player, you're going to be extremely happy with how your starting lineup has turned out. Yeah. I, I like him this year. Like you said, with the touchdown disparity, I would expect that to not even out, but obviously get a little bit closer. It, it will be interesting to see now that he's moving back to the slot, if that production returns. And if you want to dig into it with the new, OC, you know, he was the OC of the Rams in 2022 when Cooper Cup was playing in the slot for like 50 plus percent of his snaps and was on a historic run before getting hurt. Not that Godwin is is Cooper Cup, but kind of just looking for for small things to to nitpick. But I will say, like, I I do like Jalen McMillan a lot. I think he's really underrated, and I think he's going to play outside and take targets away. I, I don't think he's going to be fantasy relevant, but. Um, that scares me off a bit, but at this ADP, yeah, I think he's someone that I'm, I'm comfortable tar targeting and I think he will, uh, have a, a solid campaign. Yeah. And, and again, it, this is maybe just a statement to how many good wide receivers there are, you know, like yeah. the breaking down the value, right. Is that, is there really a difference between him and Ridley? You know, are we confident that there's going to be a difference between 37 and 26? Like, it's just it's just difficult at this position, at, at this section of the draft to really rank these guys with any sort of conviction. And so keep that in mind too, as you're watching, if you hear what we're saying, or you have confirmation bias on one of these guys that you want, that you've been wanting to push up and you hear something positive from us, like do it. Uh, these, these guys are all kind of going to be lotto picks basically. Right. And you want to try and hit on the guys that you want and that you like. And so go ahead and take the guys out of this range that you, that you like. So just keep that in mind. Don't, don't necessarily keep these rankings as like, uh, you know, oh, they said that, you know, 36. So I had to pick him over Godwin. That's not necessarily, you know, the case. So just keep that in mind when, when reviewing our rankings or reviewing any rankings, really like make sure that you're picking out the guys that you like. And even if it feels like a little bit of a reach at this area of the draft, just, just go ahead and take the guy you want. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a great point. And, you know, this is what makes three wide receiver leagues fun because these guys are, are still starters. Yeah. yeah way better. All right. 20, uh, number 38, Lad McConkey. Lad, my guy. So we've done a lot of content on Lad, both pre-draft and, you know, I did a, a rookie breakdown video as well. Um, unfortunately, he did have kind of an undisclosed injury at practice this past weekend. But assuming all that's cleaned up, I think we'll continue to hear strong reports about, you know, his rapport with Justin Herbert. Um, you know, with the departure of Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, there's a clear void that needs to be filled on this team. I think we know what Josh Palmer is at this point, and I think that he's fine. I think with Lad's route running ability and underrated strength and speed, I think he'll very quickly become Justin Herbert's favorite target. Um, we know this team wants to run the ball, but it's not like they're just going to take it out of Herbert's hands. And if there's a chance that I get Herbert's number one target at an ADP of around 40, like give me that all day. And yeah, you know, he can play all over the field. I, I know sometimes people think he's just going to go into that slot role, but he only played 20% of the snaps in the slot 
at Georgia his last year and college is different. Sure. But I think they're going to move him all over. And I think I've already heard some people saying like, Oh, he's not going to be on the field for three wide receiver sets. And I, I just, I don't believe that because I don't believe that they're going to take their best wide receiver off the field. Like I just have a hard time thinking that it's going to be Josh Palmer and DJ Chark or if QJ's out there, like, I don't know. I, I don't get it. And I've been drafting them all over and I'm going to continue. My my guttural reaction was to laugh when you said they're taking him off the field for two wide receiver sets. I mean, come on. Yeah. They're not doing thank that. you. Unless unless it's a blocking yeah. play, baby. You know? And they, sure. they want they want the big bodied receivers out there for blocking or something. That's kind of the only situations I see him coming off the field. I bet you that he's running routes on probably like ninety percent of the pass plays. So yeah. Um, if you heard that as well, please don't buy that. There, that is not going to be happening. McConkie's going to be out there a ton. He's going to be the top target earner on the team. So, um, yeah, I really like McConkie. Like like you said, though, we did a bunch of content on McConkie already, so let's move into number 39, uh, Rashi Rice. So I did mention earlier uh, about his suspension, right? And this ranking, the reason I included him here, because I, I was thinking about not including him, but I do want to highlight that his court date isn't set until December now. And we saw it with Alvin Kamara where he didn't get suspended the season after his uh, indiscretions. And it took an entire season for the court process to play out. And then he was suspended. So the fact that it's not until December now, I'm starting to think that we're going to get news here very soon that Rice is not going to be suspended to start the year. Um, and if that happens... Like, obviously, that ranking doesn't mean anything, right? You got to push him into the top 20. Um, and I, I mean that seriously. Like, he was he was in the top 10 weekly ranks at the end of last year. Obviously, he was the only game in town at receiver. You know, they, they brought in Hollywood Brown. They brought in Xavier Worthy. But if he's not going to get suspended, he's the incumbent number one. And he works short area. He's, he can work down the field. I expect him to get high volume. Um, if, if he's not going to miss any time, he's been in camp. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to include him to highlight, like there's, there's legitimate upside here right now. And if your drafts are this week, um, and he's still at this ADP, I highly, highly recommend taking him, uh, just, just figure out a way to get him on your team. Even if it turns out that he's suspended and you have to cut him or, or, you know, leave him on your bench. Um, obviously that wouldn't be great, but even at this price, that would be fine. And so just figure out a way to get him until we get news either way, because at this point, the, the reward of getting a player this late that is going to rocket up rankings if there is no suspension is worth the risk. Yeah. And especially everyone that's drafting teams now, all the guys are, you know, hyped up and healthy. If you leave a draft with, you know, Amon Ra and Chris Olave, and then you fill out your running backs, quarterbacks, things like that, and you can take Rice, like, and you don't even need him week one. There's just, like you said, to have the upside of a top 12 wide receiver as your number three is just, it's insane. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really hoping in the next couple of weeks we get news. I, our draft is August 23rd. I really hope we don't have to be dealing with this during our draft that we don't, that we yeah. won't know. So again, if you're drafting early, make sure you're aware of this because this is a potential area of the draft where it's going to be like, dude, what, how is everybody not all over this? Um, especially right, right in this time. So yeah. um, read about it, look into it more, but make uh, my advice would be make sure you figure out a way to get him on your team at this point in draft season. Um, all right. And then number 40, your guy. Yeah, my guy, Keon Coleman. So similar to what I talked about with Vlad McConkey and Justin Herbert, Coleman has a legitimate shot to be Josh Allen's number one target on this offense. Um, I'm glad we're past the bad 40 time stage. It's funny how people get so wrapped up in that during the draft process, but he had the same 40 time as like Amon Ross St. Brown, just slower than T Higgins and Puka Nakua. And we never talk about those guys 40 times anymore because they're great players. And, you know, not only did Florida state revolve their offense around Keon Coleman when they went undefeated last year, he outperformed Jaden Reed when they were on the same team at Michigan state. If you want to know what type of athlete, all-around athlete, this guy is. He played for Tom Izzo on the basketball team his freshman year, so just a, a crazy athletic freak. Now, my my fear and the downside with Keon Coleman is that you know maybe they just stick him at X and you know 
say, go win against press brand coverage, and that's not necessarily his strong suit. And if that doesn't work out, they leave him off the field a little bit and they start to fade him. But, um, you know, I, I do think there's a good chance he ends up kind of playing power slot as he gets more acclimated. And I think that he would be very good in that role. But, um, you know, there is a floor, like I mentioned with that, but it is current ADP of like 50, like give me the upside all day. And I will sing Coleman's praises until he flames out. And if he does flame out, I'll make an apology video next off season. And something, something else just in general to highlight the upside. There is no doubt, none, that he is the most talented receiver on the team. So this is going to be, if he's able to figure out the offense, if he's able to become reliable on knowing the playbook and the route running and all of that stuff. And if you draft Coleman, I would highly recommend you hold him. Do not get impatient with him after three weeks. It's not worth it. If you believe in him, you have to be willing to wait until at least we're into the buys a little bit, a little bit, right? If you're at week seven and you need a spot and he's still not producing, okay, maybe. But like, if you get to week five in your first bye weeks and he's your first cut, I would highly recommend not doing that. Um, somebody in your league, like one of us, will be adding him if you do that. And it's going to be like, oh, this is great. I didn't even have to pick Keon Coleman. Somebody in my league cut him, and now I get him on my roster for free um, after I got a chance to see who busted on my on my team for, for the draft. You know, So uh, that would be my advice on Coleman if you do end up with him. Love it. All right, and with that, that is our wide receiver 26 to 40. Um, we've gone pretty deep into the wide receiver uh, tiers now. So leave a comment down below if you want to see more. Um, you know, we do, we are a three wide receiver flex, uh, half PPR, like specialty. So we do want to try and get as much wide receiver content out there as possible because these guys are going to make or break your season. So um, we look forward to seeing you in the next one.